Welcome to chapter six, bones and the skeletal tissue. When we classify the bones, um, we, we have different methods of classification. All right, let's start with the basics. Okay, there's 206 bones named in the human body. We will be learning all of them along with their bone markings this semester. Um, now, when we initially divide up the bones, the first classification is based on the fact that our bones are put into two groups. The axial skeleton the, and the appendicular skeleton. The axial skeleton um, is going to run like the axes of a graph parallel. And so it'll include the skull, the vertebral column, and the entire rib cage. Okay, so it's here highlighted in orange and it runs straight up and down like the y-axis of a graph. Okay, now the appendicular skeleton on the other hand is going to be the bones of your limbs, your upper limbs, okay, and their joints and your lower limbs. including the pelvic girdle. Next, we classify bones based on their shapes. Now, it shouldn't be surprising that we have long bones, short bones, flat and irregular. A long bone is, okay, this is an example of a long bone. This is your upper arm, which is technically called the humerus bone. Okay, and the reason why not all long bones are this long. Uh, we have long bones that are actually in our phalanges, but, and they're very, very short. Uh, but the fact is that they are longer than they are wide. As long as they are longer than they are wide, they are considered a long bone. Okay, um, the bones of the limb are most commonly going to be the long bones, or right, they fall into that classification. Short bones, okay, short bones are going to be cube shaped, um, like in the wrist and ankle. So if we zoom in on a short bone, we can zoom in on more than one short bone here. Okay, see these little bones in the ankle, how they look like cubes. I'm sorry, the wrist, and then this one is in the ankle, uh, and it's pretty short. It's a, it's a good example. Um, so typically, they're, it's not perfectly cube-shaped, but it's, it's close enough. So typically, they're kind of cube-shaped even though some of them are triangular shaped, like, um, which is the sesamoid bones. Um, those, for example, your, your kneecap, your patella is a short bone. Um, and it's sesamoid shape. So if we look closely at that again, see that shape? It's not a square nor circle. It's kind of got this little peak right here. That's the sesamoid shape. Alrighty, very good. Now flat bones, that's pretty easy to understand. They're thin, flat, slightly curved. They make up things like your sternum, okay, your shoulder blades, your scapula, which are which is called your scapula, your ribs, uh, most of the skull are flat bones. And then we have irregular bones, which are a complicated shape that don't fall into the three categories, such as your vertebral column. The skeletal system is made up of connective tissue. In fact, it's made up of three types of connective tissue. 
bone, cartilage, and dense fibrous connective tissue. The skeletal system has three types of cartilage, hyaline, elastic, and fibrocartilage. Okay, the hyaline is going to be highlighted in blue on this skeletal, uh, skeleton. <clears throat> the elastic cartilage is highlighted in this green. And the fibrocartilage is highlighted in red. Okay, so we'll, we'll zoom in and take a closer look. Let's start with hyaline cartilage. Hyaline cartilage is one of the most abundant cartilage, cartilage types found in the human body. It has a, a big role in um, uh, resilience, uh, shock absorption, flexibility, our flexibility in particular, and supporting the skeletal system. It's also found in our joints. Okay, this term articular, I want everyone to learn that and know that articular means joints. Okay, it's found in the costal area, aka the ribs. It's found in the respiratory system, specifically in the larynx, which is your voice box. And it makes up the nasal cartilage, which is technically our nose tip. Okay, the elastic cartilage makes up a, a, a handful of locations and is found throughout the body. Its primary locations are going to make up the external ear. So your, uh, your ear lobe and the cartilage in your ear is elastic cartilage. And then your epiglottis, which is in the respiratory system. <clears throat> Fibrocartilage. Fibrocartilage is thick and it has um, a lot of strength and so we'll find it in places like these intervertebral discs in between uh, the vertebrae. The intervertebral discs are made out of fibrocartilage. The pubic symphysis which connects the pelvic girdle on this side, see this little red sliver, that is made up of fibrocartilage as well and the meniscus of the knee joint is also made up of fibrocartilage. So we can't learn the skeletal system and all the bones and everything like that without knowing the rest of the story, which is that basically, yes, there's 206 bones, but that's, that's not all we need to know. We need to know the other stuff. We need to know all of the different types of cartilage that make up this system and the other players in this system. Okay. Our bones have um, a significant amount of function, seven in fact. Um, <clears throat> so we'll go ahead and start with the first one. Um, their basic functions are to support, protect, movement, they make blood cells, um, they store our minerals, and growth factor. Growth factor storage is incredibly important. Um, and they store fats, specifically triglycerides, and they make hormones. All right, so what do we mean by support? Well, let's take a look at this guy over here. <clears throat> okay. Uh, all of these limbs that we have, they, these bones, these limbs, the structure of the skeletal system is designed to support the muscles. It's a place of attachment for the entire muscular system to be, uh, to, to be supported on. And also we have soft organs that um, need the support as well. Protection, that's pretty clear. The thoracic cavity is protected by the rib cage. The brain is protected by the skull. 
the spinal um, cord is protected by the vertebral column. All right, now movement as well. Now our bones are very strong, but they act as levers <coughs> for the muscles. They help muscles move and contract and do what they need to do. Okay, inside of the certain bone marrow cavities, like the red marrow, red bone marrow cavities, uh, blood, red blood cells are formed and our white blood cells are formed as well. Okay, the minerals that we need stored in the bones are calcium and phosphate. Now we also have growth factor in there, which is um, helpful because we need growth factor locally in this area for uh, bone cell formation. We also need it for um, bone repair and bone cell replacement. So it's right there, ready to go. Okay, uh, again, triglyceride storage. This is not anything completely surprising. Fat is an energy source and um, it's some of it is stored in our bone cavities. Okay, um, now our bone, our bones also produce hormones. One in particular called osteocalcin. And basically what osteocalcin does, it's secreted by the bones and it controls and regulates how much insulin is going to be secreted, um, thus controlling the glucose levels in the blood, and it works in tandem with our metabolic system. Okay, so our bones um, <clears throat> have two basic structures, right? So we have compact bone and spongy boned. Compact bone is like iron, like metal. It's very, very, very dense. And it has a smooth, solid appearance um, like this. Let's take a look at compact bone right here in the skull. See how smooth and solid that looks? There's also compact bone right here. Okay, now spongy bone, think of a sponge. Sponges have little holes in them, right? And in fact, spongy bone uh, looks kind of like honeycomb shaped. Okay, and um, Basically, what those pieces of honeycomb shaped structures are called, right there, it's called the trabecula of the spongy bone. And see how there's space, this empty space in here? Empty, empty. Well, it's not really empty in real life. Um, in fact, it is filled with red or yellow bone marrow, depending on exactly the location of that particular bone. Yellow and red bone marrow is going to be um, our big player in making new blood cells. Okay, next is the anatomy of the long bone. All right, so let's start with the locations. So we have the we have the diaphysis, which is the shaft of the bone. This whole region. All of this is the shaft aka the diaphysis. The ends of the bone are referred to as the epiphysis. This one's the proximal epiphysis because it is 
technically higher up in the body, distal epiphysis. Now, inside of the shaft, the diaphysis, is compact bone but it also has a cavity. It's not just the compact bone. Let's take a look. Okay, so there's a compact bone right there. And then inside we have the medullary cavity. Okay, now um, if we go up to the epiphysis, let's take a look. So you see that there's a lot of spongy bone here. Now what is this? There's this little area that's kind of solid. Okay, see that little line or that little kind of, oh, it is a line. See how that's not spongy bone right there? That is called the epiphyseal line. And so when an individual is still in their growing stages, this is where we grow from. Uh, long bones tend to have that because we have our growth spurts, right? And then eventually you stop growing and this epiphyseal line forms and solidifies. All right, now I want to point out a couple more anatomical structures. Um, notice that at the end, right here, see the end of the bones? And on this side too, they're covered with cartilage, articular cartilage. Okay, and then that cartilage is going to eventually turn into a lining. Now your bones, see this uh, kind of layer of membrane right here? Okay. That is called the periosteum. Excellent. All right, you want to know the anatomy of this long bone and the membranes that I'm going to cover in this next slide. Okay, so we're going to talk about membranes. So we already looked at the periosteum. That, uh, if we were to peel back this bone, <clears throat> you'd see this perfect little layer, right? And that's your periosteum. Every bone is uh, encased in this nice membrane, everyone. It's used for anchoring points where tendons um, meet and where ligaments meet, and it encases the entire network of bone tissue, bone cells, bone tissue. Now the endoosteum. What does endo mean? Just remember, endo means innermost. Endoosteum. Okay, so endoosteum is the lining on the inside, on the inside of this cavity. Okay, so bones are lined on the outside by the periosteum, and on the inside. If they have any kind of cavity or space, they're lined by the endoosteum. All right, so we're going to be talking about the microscopic structure of bone and in particular, we're going to be talking about what is called the Haversian system. Now, let's take a piece of bone and cut it in half and see what it looks like on the inside. And here we basically have a cross section of a piece of bone. So let's take a look inside. Now the innermost portion of this bone is made up of what is called spongy bone, which is otherwise known as cancellous or trabecular bone. And here you can see this arrow pointing to the trabecula of spongy bone. And so it's no surprise that if you take a look at spongy bone that it looks pretty much a lot like a sponge. 
And in fact, because of all these various trabeculae or cavities, the surface area of spongy bone is 10 times that of the outer layer of compact bone. So basically spongy bone is just this porous network of spikes surrounding the innermost portion of bone marrow. And the overall effect of this spongy network in the center of the bone is that of making the bone lighter. Now, if you look at the periphery of the bone, you have what is the harder, denser layer that surrounds the spongy bone, and that is called compact bone. And compact bone, it's no surprise that it's, well, more compact than spongy bone. It has fewer gaps and spaces. But what really makes compact bone different from spongy bone is that it has a specific type of organization made up of these osteons, these repeating functional units. And here's a blown up view of an osteon. And another word for these osteons is the Haversian system. So let's talk more about this Haversian system. So each of these osteons looks kind of like a cylinder. And it has multiple concentric layers of bone, or sheets really, that wrap around each other to form this osteon. And each of these layers is called a lamellae. And in the center of these layers is a canal called the Haversian canal, or central canal. And in this canal travels blood vessels, lymph vessels, and nerves as well. Now, in between these sheets of lamella are these tiny channels that are called canaliculi, which you can kind of see here. They branch out from the central Haversian canal to these empty spaces that are called lacunae. And whenever you see the word lacuna or lacunae, you should think empty space. And so each of these lacunae is really just an empty space for osteocytes or bone cells. And these osteocytes have these long cellular processes that branch through the canaliculi to contact other osteocytes via gap junctions, which allow these cells to communicate with each other and exchange nutrients and, and signals with each other. And then finally, you have these Volkmann's canals, which are canals that run perpendicular to the Haversian canals. And these connect osteons to one another and also, as you can see, carry their own set of small blood vessels. And let's not forget that the very outermost superficial layer of bone is called the periosteum. Peri meaning around or surrounding. And so that's the layer of bone that is on the outermost that you can actually see with the naked eye. I want to take an even closer look at the osteocyte. So let's go ahead and zoom in on that. All right, now what we're looking at here, clearly this is the full osteon, right? And see this little tiny kind of odd, cylind uh, I'm sorry, not cylindrical, tapered um, shape. In fact, this is indeed an osteocyte. Now the osteocyte, see this little arrow here? This arrow is showing us that we are zooming in on this tiny little area. So, and there it is, okay? All right, so within this empty chamber, which is the lacuna, is the osteocyte. And therefore, that, that's a, that's the bone that's an actual bone cell okay so i want you guys to know the difference between a cell which is these little tiny specks right i'm going to check mark a couple of them cell that's a cell a cell a cell and i know that because i can see the nucleus cell cell right okay and this whole system right here is the osteon so do not mix up your cells with the osteon structure because that is a large group of cells, right? All right, now osteocytes sit inside of this empty chamber called the lacuna, okay? And um, 
in order to communicate with neighboring cells. So let's say there's uh, this guy needs to communicate with its neighboring cell. How does it do that? Well, they have a direct branching connection. See all these little branches? Those are the canna loculi, and it allows neighboring cells to communicate with one another. So that's a deeper, closer look at the perversion system, and specifically at the osteocytes in the lacuna. Okay, excellent. This is another view of the bone, and you can see the osteon uh, is cylindrical, and they've pulled it. They've pulled it apart, so you can see that it's been. This is the innermost region, and then it gets that wraps around it, and that wraps around that, and every osteon. looks like a little tree trunk. See those rings? Alrighty. So you want to know the full anatomy of the osteon and all of its parts, um, including the central canal, the lamella, the layers of lamella, the, um, the fact that nerves, arteries, veins, and lymphatic tissue runs in the central canal. Um, the color, the canaliculi and how it connects two osteocytes together. Um, and of course, uh, the, the periosteum and don't forget the canals that connect, um, horizontally. Okay, so we're going to... Look closer at bone cells. Now, our cells uh, begin their journey as a stem cell, and they are instructed to um, go on and specialize in what they're supposed to be. Okay, so it's no surprise here that the very first bone cell is gonna start off as a stem cell. Okay. And many of them will go on and become osteoblasts. Now remember from <clears throat> remember from uh, previous material and a blast, something that, that uh, ends in blast means what? If something is ending in, in the suffix blast, that means that it's not a fully mature cell, but in fact, it's a matrix synthesizing cell. What type of matrix? Osteo matrix. That's where the whole term, remember osteo means bone, okay? And blast means that it's matrix synthesizing. So these osteoblasts make, make bone. They make your bones. Um, sometimes your bones need to be re renewed right? Sometimes bone cells technically need to be repaired. Osteoblasts will be responsible for doing that, okay? Osteocyte and osteocyte is a mature bone cell, and its job is to monitor and maintain the bone matrix. Now, osteoclast, okay? Osteo, of course, means bone, and clast, if you remember, means breaking down something. So when your bones are being broken, uh, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, when they're being renewed, let's say, uh, at the exact same time that, the, that an osteoblast is renewing the bone cell, uh, an osteoclast is going to be disintegrating or breaking down bone that is how those are the two cells responsible for bone renewal. Oops. 
All right, so terminology. Chondro means cartilage. Blast means matrix forming. A, a chondroblast is a cartilage forming cell. An osteoblast, again, is a bone forming cell, aka cr matrix creating cell. But specifically, that matrix that we're discussing here today in regards to an osteoblast is bone. Osteocytes, mature bone cells, osteoclast, bone dissolving cells, aka breaking down that matrix, which is very specifically bone. Okay, you want to know the cells and what their primary function is. Now, when we look at our bones, we have something called bone markings. There's three types of markings. Projection, depressions, and openings. A projection is going to be something that bulges outward, like the head on a femur, or even these two points. This is the trochanter of the femur, right? Uh, a depression or um, a groove-like cutout, most of the time um, what this is uh, is going to be a pathway for vessels like veins and arteries to pass through and supply bone tissue or supply an organ nearby um, with all of its nutrients and um, all, all of the neurons that belong in that area as well. Okay, they have a role in our joints. Now, we have several depressions in this picture. Let's take a look at a couple actually. This one right there, the inferior orbital fissure. There's one on each side, okay? Um, this little groove in the jaw, an opening or a hole. This is the best one. Well, not the best one, but the most straightforward one. See this big hole at the bottom of your skull? This is the foramen magnum, and of course this is where the, the spinal cord connects to the brain. So part of anatomy is learning all of the bones, their cellular structures, and then you're going to learn bone markings as well. All right, so we'll do that a little bit at a time. Now, what happens if a bone breaks? What's, what's going to happen here? Um, your body is incredibly intelligent. And let's say there's a clean break like this one. The first thing that'll happen is a hematoma will form. And the body will respond immediately and start repairing these broken blood vessels, so forming new blood vessels, angiogenesis, okay, and that hematoma is going to turn into, well, it's going to get replaced by uh, fibrocartilage, making this small callus. Now, that can't stay there forever, right? Now, the the system will make new bone tissue. Okay, osteoblasts are clearly going to play a huge role here and class and repair the bone tissue and then remodel it and have a completely healed fracture. And that's that's that can happen or that happens with a clean break that doesn't need surgery, right? If it, if it wasn't a clean break, we would be dealing with something different. Um, it would heal this way, but it would heal incorrectly. This is a clean break, so it, it healed perfectly 
all the way to the end. Okay, let's talk about fractures. So we have several different types of fractures. Um, some of them are quite uh, dangerous and detrimental and will end up needing surgery and things like that. Some of them are clean. Okay, let's look at this one. All right, so what's happening here is here's the break or the fracture, right? And notice it's broken into uh, three or more pieces. That, that's a terrible fracture. And uh, it happens more with age. People with osteoporosis are more prone to these types of breaks, okay? actually highlight this whole thing. Okay, this is a comminuted fracture, a compression fracture. It's right here next to it. This is when the bone is crushed. It usually happens in uh, <clears throat> porous type bones, meaning that there's more osteoporic bones. Um, <clears throat> and rather than uh, compact bone. Okay, now here we see a vertebrae and it's pretty destroyed. This, um, it's just completely crushed. Usually this was from a trauma, um, a fall, uh, car accident, things like that. A spiral fracture. A spiral fracture is when we see twisting. See this kind of shape? It's a ragged break, and this occurs if the bone is twisted. It usually happens in, in sports medicine or sports in general. Okay, an epiphyseal fracture. Okay, an epiphyseal fracture separates the epiphysis from the diaphysis. So see this? <laughs> it's shifted over. Okay, this can usually happen with age as cartilage wears down as well. Okay. Next, a depressed fracture. Depressed fractures are somewhat rare, I think, and ultimately what happens is um, the broken bone is pressed inward, and of course this is going to, um, could be lethal, uh, usually is. Okay, so if a person does survive it, they're gonna be in a dangerous situation. Um, if they get them in there fast enough, they might be able to save their life. All right, a green stick. This is when the bone doesn't break completely and only one side of the bone breaks. This is more common in children uh, than it is adults because of their bone structure having more cartilage and being more flexible. All right, very good. Now this is the end of chapter six and I will see you guys next time.